Coming up next, Book TV presents Afterwards, an hour-long program where we invite guest hosts to interview authors. This week, acclaimed science writer James Glick discusses his latest work, A History of Information, beginning with the development of various alphabets and ending with what's expected next from the information age, the author of Chaos chronicles the evolution of how thoughts and knowledge have been passed from one to another throughout human history. He talks with Frank Rose, a contributing editor of Wired magazine and the author of The Art of Immersion. James, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having us. <laughs> no, thrilled to be here. I really enjoyed your book. Um, it's, uh, it's been great fun to read and I must say quite informative. Thank you. Um, now, um, one thing I was sort of fascinated uh, by, um, the year 1948. I mean, clearly that was, a, that was a, 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 a banner year, so to speak, in terms of setting the stage for the world we live in today. That was the year that the transistor was invented, the year that Claude Shannon came up with his uh, information theory, and um, that, um, uh, th that Norbert Wiener uh, published his book, Cybernetics. Um, what was it about that year? Wh wh why did all of these things come together then, do you think? That, is the, that year is the starting point for my book. Well, because I start the book in the middle. But it's the pivotal moment, and I, I think it's, it's rare that we have, um, we're able to pick one year and say, that this is the fulcrum around which the whole modern world has turned. But I really believe that about 1948. And you've, you've named the two things that apparently, coincidentally, came out of Bell Labs right. in the same year, the transistor and um, Claude Shannon's information theory. Claude Shannon is sort of the central figure of my book um, because of this starting point, because um, in 1948, he published in the obscure technical journal of the Bell Labs system um, two papers during the summer called A Mathematical Theory of Communication. And then they became a book, The Mathematical <laughs> Theory of Communication. And it was the first time, among other things, it was the first time anyone used the word bit as a unit of measure for this stuff, information. <coughs> But what was it? You know, he would go around reminding people or telling people that uh, he was going to use this word in a scientific way, and he needed people to understand that it, while it was related to the ordinary everyday sense of the word, it was something different. He was going to make it something mathematical and quantitative. So 1948 is, I think, not exactly the start of what we now call the information age. But I'd like to say it's the start of the time in which we began to realize that all human history had been an information age. <laughs> right. How did he come up with the term bit? Where, where, did, where did that come from? Bit was actually, as far as anyone can tell, invented by a statistician named John Tukey, um, who worked at Princeton for many years. Actually, I interviewed him once because he was a roommate of Richard Feynman. Hmm. Um, he was a wonderful guy, and uh, there was a lot of discussion at, at the time about this um, not yet invented mythical quantity. Anyway, bit is short for binary digit, mm -hmm. and of course it's a nice little word that refers to something, you know, well we know what it is, it's on or off, yes or no, right. true or false. Right. Um, <coughs> that connection already which lies at the heart of so much of the computer era is also due to Shannon, mm -hmm. who um, <coughs> wrote a master's thesis when he was barely 20 years old, in which he was, a, he was getting a degree in electrical engineering. And he wrote a thesis connecting the analysis of electrical circuits with George Boole's symbolic logic from the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Now these were two, two ideas that just <laughs> seemed to any normal person so distant from one another. I mean, I inhabiting different planes of existence. You know, electrical circuits, most people who are electrical engineers were doing things to do with hardware and current, right, right. you know, and resistance. Right. And 
Claude Shannon was thinking of them in a, in a completely abstract way, where a circuit could be on or off. And he made this connection that on or off could be the same as true or false. And then you could link circuits together and you could have logic. You could have if, then. Right, right. Well, all this is sort of second nature to us now if we know anything about computers, because computers are built on this, <coughs> this equivalence right. between circuitry and logic. But this is where it was invented. And so the bit is the fundamental unit, the binary digit. So um, the transistor, you know, we, we, we know a lot about William Shockley. He's, uh, you know, been quite a notorious figure. But we know much less about Claude Shannon, uh, just in the popular imagination. Tell me, what was he like, uh, you know, as a person back then? He was something of a loner. Mm -hmm. He was shy. Um, Bell Labs at that time had a, had a big old industrial building on West Street. Right. The building is still there uh, downtown New York, just on the edge of Greenwich Village and it's on the other side. Yes. Yeah, oh, you know it. Yes. It's, a, it's an artist's collective now or right. something like that. And exactly. um, the, uh, in the old pictures, you can see the high line railroad line running right through the lower sto stories of the building. That picture is in your book. I love that picture. Um, anyway, right around this time, it was just after the war, uh, most of Bell Labs moved out to the suburbs in New Jersey, to Murray Hill. And uh, Claude Shannon, who officially worked for the mathematics department, kind of stayed behind on his own in a cubby hole. And, um, <laughs> Did he have a window? <laughs> I don't even know if he had a window. I know that he was, he was flirting with a young woman who worked across the street uh, during the war in the, uh, what they, it was the old Nabisco building. Uh -huh. They called it the Cracker Factory. Right. In the microwave research group. And he, and he later married this woman. This was Betty Shannon. Uh -huh. <coughs> um, but because during the war he had done really important and useful work, he worked on cryptography especially, and because Bell Labs was a really unique institution where they believed in the value of pure research, because of these two things, people left Claude Shannon alone. Mm -hmm. he, his managers didn't know exactly what he was working on, but he just was allowed to do what he was doing. And what he was doing was apparently not particularly useful, um, unlike the transistor. The transistor, everybody knew was going to be a big deal. And when it was announced that same year, you mentioned Shockley and, uh, and his two co-workers, um, became immediately famous. Bell, Bell Labs put out a big press release. Um, the transistor we now know replaced those bulky, um, hot vacuum tubes and enabled the miniaturization of electronics. Right. You know, almost immediately there were transistor radios. And, and then combined with the, the technology of the integrated circuit, it became the underpinning of our computer world. You know, now we have billions of transistors literally in our pockets. I mean, I could pull my device out of my pocket, and I bet you could too, Frank. <laughs> yes, I'm um, sure I could. That's billions of transistors right there. Shannon's theory, which came out at the same time, <coughs> at first blush had nothing to do with that. It was a coincidence. He was thinking at least officially, about telephone wires, old copper analog telephone mm -hmm. wires. And his theory of, of communication uh, was of, of great use in coming up with techniques for compressing information and sending it efficiently over these analog wires, for example, in the presence of noise. But while he solved a lot of these problems in an analog way, he simultaneously solved them in a digital way, hmm. meaning not just you know, sine waves right. where everything is continuous, right. but in terms of what we now call bits, right. thanks, thanks to Shannon. That's where everything is broken up, it's discrete, and um, it's digital. And in our world, that makes it suitable for storage on all kinds of new devices. Instead of just vinyl phonograph records, we have compact disks, which store many times more uh, bits, mm -hmm. because they're little microscopic pits engraved with right. a laser right. on a s on a substance.